we're so happy to have you joining us today on Today with Marilyn and Sarah. We are going to have a magnificent time and I want to just kind of whet your appetite because we have some very special guests with us. But before we jump into our interview, and I'm telling you, you're going to love, oh my goodness, you're going to love our guests. But I want to minister just a couple verses to you, encourage you out of John 14. Jesus talks about at the end of his life, he said, you know, I'm going up to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for you that you could come and join me. And I want to encourage you, if you don't know where you're planning to spend eternity, then obviously you need to watch this program today, but also we want to help you settle that in your heart. So you can get on the phone and say, pray with me. I want to know about how, where I'm going to spend my eternity. We want to pray with you on that. Or, you know, you can get on the website and we'll pray for you that way as well. But we are excited about your eternity, about what God has for you, about your life even here and now. And mom, we're totally excited yes. about these cool guests that we have. Tell us. Well, we have Pastor Todd Burpo and his son, Colton, Colton today. How cool. And this is so special because of the book, Heaven is for Real. Wow. I'm telling you, I read that book. I cried. I got up in the night and cried some more, read some more, finished the book. And I thought, oh, Lord, we talk about heaven. We read it in the Bible, but it just really brought it home to me. It's so wonderful. And this is a New York Times best-selling book. I mean, this isn't just kind of oh. you and I wrote something on the right, side, you know, right. a little thing. This is a major, major right. book. Right. And uh, we get to have you guys with us today. What a privilege and an Thanks honor. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. So that. thrilled. So thrilled. Talk to us a little bit. Uh, kind of walk us through what was the beginning of the book and, and kind of what launched some of this. Well, Colton's uh, trip to heaven happened eight years ago. So this is not a new story for us. We've been sharing it with friends, family. Uh, for many years. Uh, but writing a book was something that really scared me. And as a dad, I was really concerned, you know, what, what does this attention do to my son mm. if I draw this attention to him? So I didn't want to write a book. And um, God had to really go to work on me uh, to get me to be willing. And I had to kind of lay out my fleece. God, if this is really you, um, you need to kind of bring the publishing world to me. And, and we were kind of discovered, if you will, over lunch, over lunch. And a friend had a friend and gave us a call and the process started. And I remember as Joel Needler, who's my agent, who was speaking to me on the phone, I had him in one ear and God in the other and, and God just sitting there going, now you gave me a promise, are you going to keep it? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to keep it. So that's where the book began. Uh, we really wanted to know, okay, God, do you really want us to do this? I think a lot of people say, well, we invented this story or we made it up. We come from a small town. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks to Colton, knows Colton. This is not new. Uh, I think it's really interesting when he goes to school and you know, his classmates, oh, yeah, Colton's been to heaven. The teachers are discovering new stuff, but he's been telling his friends since kindergarten. You go to school with the same kindergartners, first mm -hmm. graders, there's nothing new here. And, but it's obviously a testimony, his testimony, that God wanted more people to hear than just people in Imperial, and here we are. Imperial, Nebraska. Yes, Imperial, Nebraska. And you're a Westland pastor? I am. In Imperial, Nebraska. Yep. Now, tell me, because Colton had a very serious physical condition that really kind of opened this door. Can you share about that? That would be yeah, terrible it, for you and your wife. For us, you know, I think a parent's worst nightmare is watching a child suffer. Mm. And then when you realize your child's on the brink of death, you know, it's just, it's urgent. <clears throat> like my wife says, this is another reason why it's hard for us to write the book. Some memories you want to forget. Right. And uh, he got sick and um, uh, it looked like the stomach flu. It was going around town, all the kids were getting it. And he was throwing up in the, in the hospital. We were in a hotel and here we are on vacation trying to celebrate some <clears throat> break in my period of testing and little did I know our worst test was coming and his sister gets sick so we literally have one child that's heaving into the toilet another one into the bathtub <laughs> and, and so it looks like we have the bug except sister gets better and he doesn't and he just continues and continues and continues to throw up uh, eventually we start suspecting uh, maybe it's appendicitis and the doctors were still like well we still think it's just a worst case of the flu and or the bug, and they put him in the hospital. And after two days of continuing to see him deteriorate, uh, as a pastor, one of the uh, things that, that I've been invited to do, of course, when family members are losing a loved one, they, they want their pastors there. So I've been along beside the deathbeds of many deathbeds, and you start seeing um, a body uh, change color. You start seeing it shrivel. You start seeing the eyes set back in the head. And I was seeing this in my son. 
and scaring me to death. I mean, you're not supposed to see that in a three-year-old. So we pick him up, we take him to the closest regional medical center we had. They do a test and they confirm his appendix is ruptured. And hindsight's 2020. At that point in time, his appendix had probably been ruptured about five days. And so he, his wow. whole body was just completely full of poison. And it's in that first surgery that he went into that he talks about, Daddy, that's where the angel sang to me, and where, I, mm -hmm. where he talked about leaving his body and everything there. And, and so that's where our story began, and, began, and that's what led up to uh, Colton's trip to heaven. But that was a miracle that he lived. Isn't oh, it was that a true? huge miracle for us. I, I think, you know, a lot of children might suffer with it, but he was in really bad shape. Uh, I remember talking to the surgeon before. I'd had a lumpectomy, uh, which is pretty much like a mastectomy. Uh, but in official terms, I guess it's called a lumpectomy. But the doctor that had performed that was the one that was on call when we went to the emergency room. So we had a prior relationship with him. And I, I remember asking Dr. O'Holler, and I said, is he going to be okay? And he said nothing. You know, that's scary. Wow. Wow. How did your wife deal with this? <laughs> no, she was... She was in tears. She was crying, you know, because um, one of the hardest things w was seeing, you know, here's your kid, and he can't even almost move. You're just holding a, this limp, lifeless, almost shell mm -hmm. of a body because he's so yeah. ravaged by all the, the days of dehydration, throwing up the poison mm -hmm. in his system. And, uh, yeah, we, were, we knew that we were in trouble, really serious trouble. And it was, like I say, it was a nightmare. It was scary. Now, you tell in your book about the words he said to you as he was being taken in for the surgery. Could you share that? Yeah. And because I feel that it's very key here. Yeah. Well, I think most of the time, you know, when a kid gets hurt, they fall down, they scrape their knee, they yell, Mommy. Hmm. And uh, when he was being hauled away, he wasn't yelling, Mommy, he was yelling for Daddy. Hmm. <clears throat> and he's just like, Daddy, make him stop. Daddy, help me. And uh, I'm sitting there in the hospital. How do you explain to a three-year-old that he has to have surgery? And he's just looking at me like, Daddy, do your job. You're not doing your job. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> that's the lowest I've ever been in my whole life at that moment. And uh, obviously, I write in the book, I'm just so mad at God that the first opportunity I had we had to sign paperwork after they wheeled him off, and I can still hear the screams as he's going down and being mm -hmm. wheeled, wheeled, <clears throat> wheeled away. Those screams are things that, you know, a lot of people ask us today, do you have any pictures of Colton while he was in the hospital? Oh, no. We, we had this illusion that we could forget if we didn't take pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't. Right. And uh, as they're wheeling him away and we're signing papers, here I am, I'm kind of like with, in this terrible position, one, I'm trying to be strong for my wife. I don't want to show fear for my son. As a pastor, I'm in this position where I just want to explode, but I can't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when laymen blow it, there's forgiveness for laymen, but there's not for pastors. They mm -hmm. fire pastors when pastors blow yeah. it. And I'm just, just I'm, I'm enraged. So I finally have a chance that a nurse comes and says, I'm going to go out to the waiting room. She takes my wife but we left some stuff in the pre-op room. So I go back to that room to get our stuff. I shut the door, I close the curtains, and I just let God have it. Mm. I mean, I'm just mad, I'm frustrated. I'm like, God, I've gone through so many things this last year. I, I couldn't work because I broke my leg. I'd had a cancer scare. I'd had uh, kidney stones. And now we were celebrating the end of my t time of testing. I was just learning how to walk again. And it's like, now you're gonna take my son. Mm. This is how you treat your pastors. Mm -hmm. I was incredibly mad at God, but I hadn't given up on God. There's a, I, I think there's a difference there. I, think you, I still knew God was my best shot, but I'm like, what in the world are you doing? Mm -hmm. And I was at that point where in that hospital room, I just kind of let God have it. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't tell anyone about it. My wife didn't know where I was, what I was doing. When I finally regained my composure, if you will, and then got my stuff and went out to the waiting room to join my wife. She was mad at me because it was like, where have you been? Mm. I'm out here and I'm, I'm just about out of battery on my cell phone, calling people. She grabs my cell phone, continues to call people to ask them to pray. And we were just in that, that moment of, God, we need you now. Mm -hmm. We need a miracle right now. Mm. 
You know, Mom, I know yeah. that there are people watching who, oh, yeah. who are in a similar position, right. mad at God, yeah. feeling like God has abandoned them, abused them, mistreated them, neglected them. And you may be watching right now and you may feel very similar to Pastor Todd and say, you know, I'm very angry with God. I am mad. And where is he? And we want to pray for you. And, and I love that you didn't give up. I love that you right. didn't give up. And, and I think that's so fantastic because so many times we get mad at God and I think we hold it in and we don't know. And, and God can handle your anger. He can handle your disappointment. And He's there and He's engaged. But please let us, let us pray for you. Get on the phone. Let us pray for you. Get on the website. Leave a prayer request. But we want to pray for you that even in your anger, you don't thro throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, I think, you know, people, life's going to hit you. You know, Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Mm. You know, this is not heaven yet. Right. Um, and I remember Thomas, uh, when he was mad, you know, Jesus showed up and, and he's the only one that missed it. I don't know if he was out getting milk or whatever, but at the same time, he's like, hey, wait a minute. You know, the, the time I'm gone, mm -hmm. that's when God shows up mm -hmm. and it shows to everyone else he's risen and leaves me out. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he was mad. I mean, he was so mad. He says, I will not even believe his closest friends mm -hmm. that what you're telling me is true because mm -hmm. he was so mad at God himself. But it says in the word, a week later, mm -hmm. Jesus came back mm -hmm. and for a week, Thomas, was, you know he was mad, but he didn't go anywhere. Right. And a lot of people, when they hit those anger spots or when life hits you, they want to run. Mm -hmm. The question is, are you going to run to God or away mm -hmm. from God? I, I look at that, and, and Thomas at least knew where to stay. Mm -hmm. Okay, God, I'm mad, but I'm waiting on you to do something. Mm -hmm. I'm not running from you. This is so good wow. because it's so where we live. I mean, all of us face wow. tragedy, crisis, all these kinds of things. What are we going to do? Are we going to run to God or are we going to run from God? We need Him too much to run away from Him. Even though we don't understand, hang in there. Call us and we're going to be right back. When Colton Burpo made it through an emergency appendectomy, his family was overjoyed at his miraculous survival. What they weren't expecting was the story that emerged in the months that followed. A story as beautiful as it was extraordinary, detailing their little boy's trip to heaven and back. With disarming innocence and the plain spoken boldness of a child, Colton recounts his amazing experiences from his visit to heaven. Heaven is for Real offers a glimpse of the world that awaits us. Heaven is for Real, a New York Times best-selling book, will forever change the way you think of eternity, offering a chance to see and believe like a child. For your gift of $25 or more, we'll send you Heaven is for Real and Marilyn's two CD teaching set, Heaven and Angels, where Marilyn encourages us that heaven is a real place and angels are sent to earth to protect the household of faith. You will be inspired and blessed by these two powerful resources. Call or click today. Phnom Penh, Cambodia, has an extremely prominent sex industry. Sex workers have few options for their babies while they work at night. Most babies are left alone in dangerous and devastating conditions. Nightcare, the first of its kind, is a safe haven for these babies. Here is where babies are happy, protected, fed, and cared for nightly. Will you help the least of these? Night Care from Saving Moses. I'm so delighted you are watching, and I know you are delighted. And we are thrilled about having Pastor Todd Burpo and his son Colton with us today. And the book, Heaven is for Real, I'm telling you, when I read that book, it just so touched me. Of course, you know all the scriptures, watch people die, you know, but it just really brought Jesus very real to me because the first thing Colton says that you see in heaven is Jesus. Yeah. And that just really warmed my heart. So I'm glad you're watching because you're going to see, and I really be, believe you're going to experience the presence of the Lord right there where you are. Mm -hmm. Now, the good thing is that Colton lived. Yeah. So tell about, you know, here he is, he's rushed into surgery, no opportunity for him to live according to what they told you. Well, they didn't say anything. You know, 
I think doctors many times, I think we live in a world where, you know, lawsuits are a part of this world, so to protect themselves. But he looked really bad, and so they just gave us no hope, no confidence, mm -hmm. but we're, all we can do is what we can do, you know. And uh, I remember we had this discussion uh, a couple years ago, uh, right after Colton got out of the hospital when we were in his room. He brings it up. I, I think the Holy Spirit prompted me after he started sharing his, his revelations about heaven, going back to that moment when he comes out of the hospital and surgery, and that, that, that first surgery. Um, a nurse came out into the same waiting area where I'd rejoined my wife and asked, is Colton's daddy out here? Uh, and I just kind of said, I'm here. And you just kind of brace yourself. And she's like, well, he's been screaming for you, and we can't calm him down. And you're just kind of like, oh, he made it. Mm -hmm. And then at this time, his mother looks at me. Well, I'm his mother. Why isn't he yelling for me? And she wasn't saying any of that the first time when they were willing him away. Yeah. And I get up, and I just leave her there. You know, I'm just trying to run towards my son. She follows me quickly. But a couple months after that, when we start figuring out what's going on, I remember the Holy Spirit prompted me just to ask Colton this question. I said, Colton, remember you said when Jesus came to get you that he was sending you back from heaven? Did you want to come? You know, some questions you're like, I have to ask the question, but I don't know what he's going to say. Mm. And he looked up at me and he said, no, Dad, I wanted to stay. But then he says, Dad, but do you remember when I was yelling for you in the hospital when I woke up? I said, oh, yeah, I'll never forget that. Because those screams that mm -hmm. cut me to the core were those screams that I rejoiced at mm -hmm. after the surgery, you know? He says, well, the reason why I was yelling for you, Dad, is that when Jesus came to get me, he told me he was answering your prayer. That's why he was sending me back. And uh, we had to work through that whole process. And he even says... You know, when he was in the hospital, he was sitting on Jesus' lap. And that prayer that I prayed was the most disrespectful, irreverent prayer I'd ever prayed. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. You know, the very God I was yelling at was the God who was holding my son on his lap while I was yelling at him. I read that in your book. That really touches me about God. Oh, yeah. And, and I think, you know, it says in the Bible, Jesus says, you know, my dad's looking for worshipers who will worship in spirit and truth. And if we could just be honest with ourselves, you know, God can handle our honesty. He wants our honesty. And at that moment when I was so scared, I was so helpless, I was so mad, and I was just being honest with myself. God knew all that was going on inside of me. He was holding my kid when I couldn't. And I think uh, there's a lot of people that are going through the storm and they don't know what God's doing and God's working on their behalf. Mm -hmm. They just can't see it. Right. And, and for my son to tell me, Dad, he answered your prayer, um, I, you talk about conviction hitting you like a ton of bricks. I, I walked out of that room and it's like, okay, what am I going to do to make that right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, wow. And, and I, I write about it in the book and how I had to confess that to other, other people. I said, you know, when I was yelling at God, he was holding my kid. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to tell you, that's, that's, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Now, when uh, did uh, Colton begin to share with you? Because I, I, you didn't anticipate any of this. Well, right in the hospital, when we got back to the room, he looks at me and says, Dad, do you know I almost died? It scared me to death. I, I, I had been begging him not to stop fighting for days. And I thought if I talked about dying, he'd quit on me. So I changed the subject. Now, if he had said, Dad, I went to heaven. Dad, I saw Jesus. I would have probably had that conversation right there. <laughs> but he started off by saying, you know, I almost died and it scared me. But four months later, we're going back through North Platte. And we say, Colton, this is where the hospital is. Do you want to go back? And he's like, oh, no, sin, Cassie, I don't want to go. But you know, Dad, the angels, they sang to me while I was there. And that's when I looked at his mother, and his mother looked at me, and we're like, has he talked to you about angels before? No. And that's when the light finally turned on for us. And then we started asking him, well, what did they sing? And he said, yeah, they, they, he went over the songs, and I was sitting on Jesus' lap. He had them sing to me because it made me feel better. And, and then I'm like, well, when? Well, why Dr. Holleran was working on me. And then he goes back to that first surgery. Well, Dad, I could see you. You were in a room by yourself praying. And he starts telling me about that room. I shut the door. I closed the curtains. My wife couldn't have told you where I was. The doctor and the nurses in there couldn't. Mm -hmm. Then he could say, I saw a mom and, and she, he described her out in the waiting area on the phone, calling friends, asking them to pray. And I'm sitting there going, 
How do you know that? Well, I was above you, and I could look down, and I could see you, Dad. And, and for the whole rest of the trip to Sioux Falls, I was trying to come up with another explanation. And on the way there, it was like, he's got to be telling the truth. He's got to be telling the, There's no way he can make this stuff up. And You know, you may be watching this program and thinking, well, is heaven really for real? Is Jesus really the Son of God? Did He die for me? Is He raised from the dead? Do I have a personal Savior? Do I have hope for the future? Is there a destiny for me that has heaven in it? And let me tell you, when you invite Jesus into your heart, your whole life has changed. And to me, it's always out of this world that one prayer can change your life forever and give you eternal life. And we try to work up and do a lot of things, but really he did it all. We just believe in what he did for us. And all you have to do is pray and invite him to come into your heart, repent of your sins, have faith in his blood. He will come in and he's so wonderful. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. I invited him in when I was 16. I'm now 80. He hasn't left and I have eternal life. And I want to lead you in that prayer and maybe you have prayed this prayer, but your life is out of sync. You're just not where you should be. This is a wonderful opportunity. So we're going to pray right now. You pray with me. And of course, here is Colton, Pastor Todd here, Sarah. We're believing for you today. Pray now. Say, Father, I believe that you sent Jesus for my sins. I have faith in his blood that he died for my sins and arose from the dead. I repent of all my sin, all my junk, all my trash. Jesus, come into my heart now. Be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Amen. 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 Now, if you prayed that prayer, I would love for you to call and just say, you know, I just prayed and received Jesus or I just mm -hmm. prayed and recommitted my life because really this is the most exciting time of your whole life. That's fantastic. Totally yes. fantastic. And I think in large part, that's in many respects why you wrote this book is for people to come and know the reality of Jesus, not just for eternity, but even now today. You know, I want to ask uh, when Colton and you talked with your dad and said, yeah, I saw you in that room. You were praying, saw your mom, you know, talking on the phone and all that. And uh, when you were in heaven, you probably saw some interesting things, yeah? And um, we're going to talk tomorrow. I don't want to give it away today because, you know, it's important for everybody to keep watching. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit tomorrow about some cool things that you saw. But tell us a little bit. When the angels sang to you, what, what did that sound like to you? Well, it just sounded like a lot of songs being sung at once, but you picked out songs that you knew and you could hear them. Yeah, it was like a whole bunch of them at the same time, but then you could recognize some of them. Yeah, did it, how did it make you feel? Well, what it did is it made me feel at home, like I was finally at home, right mm -hmm. place to be. Wow, the right place to be. Oh, that's fantastic. The right place to be. I want to tell you that you need to be with us tomorrow because we're going to ask Colton about some of the people that you met when you were in heaven and uh, even some of your relatives, a sister that you never met and, and a grandfather. So you don't want to miss tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be totally powerful. So you need to block aside, block aside the time and join us because we're going to continue this interview. It's going to be tremendously powerful and life-changing for you. So join us tomorrow. When Colton Burpo made it through an emergency appendectomy, his family was overjoyed at his miraculous survival. What they weren't expecting was the story that emerged in the months that followed. A story as beautiful as it was extraordinary, detailing their little boy's trip to heaven and back. With disarming innocence and the plain spoken boldness of a child, Colton recounts his amazing experiences from his visit to heaven. Heaven is for Real offers a glimpse of the world that awaits us. Heaven is for Real, a New York Times best-selling book, will forever change the way you think of eternity, offering a chance to see and believe like a child. For your gift of $25 or more, we'll send you Heaven is for Real and Maryland's two CD teaching set, Heaven and Angels, where Maryland encourages us that heaven is a real place and angels are sent to earth to protect the household of faith. 
you will be inspired and blessed by these two powerful resources. Call or click today. We are so excited because for the first time in the history of our ministry, we get to do a group trip, Mom, and bring you with us to Ethiopia. Oh, and I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am that you can come with us and minister and see amazing things in Ethiopia. Mom, tell us what some of the things are that we're well, seeing. Well, we're going to visit Aksum, and Aksum is where they say they have the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, Ethiopia is mentioned over 90 times in the Bible. That is so interesting there. And then we're going to be going to Lalibela, which is where the Rock Hewn Church is. That is considered one of the seven wonders of the world in this timing. And of course, the healing meetings we will have in Addis Ababa. You will love it, and God wants you to go. Why? Because I want you to use your hands to lay hands on the sick and to help us bring a great revival to this wonderful nation. Come with us. The world that we live in has tremendous stress, tremendous pressure, tremendous uh, anxiety. And if we're not careful, we can get sucked into that very easily. You know, you can get a bad report from work. You can watch some bad news on TV. You can hear something bad from a neighbor. And if we're not careful, we get sucked into those things. And I don't know about you, but even sometimes my own thinking. Sometimes I think, oh, you know, this is not good. Or I might be upset with Reese or my kids did this or I'm concerned about my dad. I mean, I can go through my own anxieties, my own stresses, my own pressures. And, oh, you know, I got it. And we can all identify with that. But I want to encourage you today that God wants us to look to him, not to keep our eyes fixed on the things that are all around us, the horizontal, but that we keep our eyes fixed on God. And I love this. In Psalms 55, verse 22, it says, Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. And you know, this is important. I want you to think about this for just a second. Cast your cares on the Lord. If you don't know where the Lord is, you don't know which way to cast your cares. I remember when I was in basketball, and I loved basketball in high school, they always said, you know, look, look at where you're going to pass. And sometimes, you know, you do some trick things, but whatever you look at is usually the direction that you go. And if you look at God, that'll help you cast your cares on him. And I also find this when I look at God, then all of those cares and worries and anxieties become very small because of the light of and the magnificence and the immensity of who he is. And so I encourage you today that you cast your cares on God. Keep your eyes fixed on him. Look up, look above the problems. Look to him, the author, the perfecter, the finisher of your faith. Cast your cares on him because God cares for you and he is amply able, well able to carry your burdens, carry your concerns, carry your pressure and stress. Mm -hmm. 